Happy Sabbath, brothers and sisters. Let me try that one more time. Happy Sabbath, everybody. Happy Sabbath. All right. It's a privilege to be here today. Um, you guys are feeling warm? Yeah? yeah. I'm cold. <laughs> yeah. This place is really cold. I'm trembling. I was like, Lord, help me. Yeah. And I'm actually thirsty, but I don't want to drink the water. If I do, I'll be trembling. Yeah, it, it's different up here. But I'm happy to be here, and I thank God for privilege that I have to speak to you today. Um, let me invite you to bow your heads with me. We want to start with a word of prayer. Oh, Father, we want to thank you for the privilege that we have today. We thank you for the Sabbath, for keeping us throughout the week. Just for gracing us, Lord, and for providing us with all that, all your blessings, your protection, your love. And now, God, we've come to reflect. We've come to just receive a word from you. We pray your blessing upon us. We pray, God, that you would speak to us. Help us, Lord, to not just listen to a message, but to, by your grace, apply to our lives so that we can be transformed. Amen. Invite your spirit here today. Bless us, we pray in Jesus' name. All right, if we can just go to the screen. The message today is captioned one more year. It's actually, can I step down? Is that okay? Okay. So it's actually, there's something that the Lord has been leading me to do. I'm actually looking at the different prophecies in the Bible. And I'm asking myself the question, you know, Adventists, when we think of prophecy, we always we point fingers. Am I talking the truth, somebody? Yeah, it, it applies to those in Rome and that kind of stuff. And that might, be, that might be true. But there's this passage of scripture that caught my attention. Romans chapter 15, verse 4. It says, for whatsoever things were written a fourth time, they were written for what? For? For whose learning? For our learning that we through patience and comfort of the scriptures might have hope. So I, I started thinking, what part of the scriptures don't apply to you, Larry? And I had to kind of realize that, you know what? Every part of the Bible applies to my life, including those difficult prophecies. So I'm, I'm, I'm kind of on a journey, and I'm trying to look at those prophecies and apply it to my life. So this message I'm preaching to you, I preach it to Larry first. And I'm now preaching it to you by the grace of God. So let's go. It's a well-known prophecy. If you can just join me. All right, if I could get the... Oh, yeah, yeah. Pastor did, did warn me. All right, let me see if I get a switch right here. It's going to work, right? Hopefully by God's grace. Any, any day now, right? <laughs> All right. Excellent. Let me also um, thank Pastor for great, just allowing me to use his pulpit. He was actually scheduled to preach today. So I really appreciate it, Pastor. All right. So let's, let's go, guys. Um, Daniel 8, 14, really well-known pastor of Scripture. The Bible says, And he said unto me, unto what? 2,300 days. Then shall the sanctuary be, be cleansed. And I mean, you can't be an Adventist and don't know the, this pastor of Scripture off your, off your head. All right. Now, of course, we know this passage. We know Daniel's struggle in terms of understanding um, what he was seeing in the vision. So let's go to the breaking down of the actual um, prophecy. So let's go together, guys. Seventy weeks are determined upon thy people and upon thy holy city to finish the transgression and to do what? Make an end of sin and to make reconciliation for iniquity and to bring in everlasting righteousness and to seal up the vision and prophecy and to anoint the most holy. Bible continues, oh, this is small. Know therefore and understand that from the going forth of the commandment to restore and build Jerusalem unto the Messiah, the Prince, shall be seven weeks, and therefore, oh, I'm not seeing, man. Sorry, guys. And two weeks, and the street shall be built again, and the wall even in troublous times. All right, we continue. We're going up to verse 27, I believe. 
And after three score and two weeks shall Messiah be cut off, but not for himself. And the people of the prince that shall come shall be destroyed, the city and the sanctuary, and the end thereof shall be with a flood. And unto the end of the war desolations are determined. And he shall confirm the covenant with many for one week. In the midst of the week he shall cause the sacrifice and oblation to cease. And for overspreading of abominations he shall make it desolate even until the consummation. And that determined shall be poured upon the desolate. We know it, guys. Let's just go through the prophecy quickly. I'm not dwelling too much on interpretation. I do believe, and I want to assume that we all here are familiar with the passage and what it means. But as we look at the passage, it's, um, we, of course, the, the Bible is interpreting Daniel 8.14. There is a 2,300-year timeline that has been presented to us. Daniel now is focusing on 70 weeks or 490 years that have been set aside or cut out for the children of Israel, for his people. And during, during that 490-year um, period, there are some things they, they, that they must accomplish as a people. Let, let's look at some of those things. So they must finish what? The transgression, and they must make an end of sins, and to make what? Reconciliation for iniquity, which means that there is forgiveness which is available. And to bring in everlasting righteousness to seal up or confirm the vision and prophecy and to anoint the most holy. God is saying, I'm giving you enough time to get this done. So let's look at some more details. Daniel receives a vision 9 to 11 years before the fall of Babylon in 539 B.C., the prophecy begins approximately 91 years after it was given to Daniel under Persian rule. And of course, we know the breakdown of the prophecy. Um, in 457 BC, the great king Artaxerxes gave that commission, that decree, so that the children of Israel could have returned back to Jerusalem and begun that process of rebuilding. Let's just, and as we go through the process, prophecy, there are so many. Um, um, pillars there that we see. Uh, for example, right in the midst of the prophecy, there is a Messiah to come and he should be anointed, etc., etc. Again, we know the prophecy. Let's now try to apply it to our own experience as Seventh-day Adventists living in the 20, 21st century. So what do I see here? And I, I want to share this with you guys. One of the first things I saw in that prophecy it was God's relentless pursuit. And I want you to follow me a bit. I'm, I'm going to take you through the prophecy. God's relentless pursuit, the fact that he wants to save you more than you yourself wants to be saved. Now, you don't believe me, but I'm going to show it to you. God, brothers and sisters, is more interested in you being saved than you are in being saved. And so he pursues you. And he allows so many things to come your way because God is trying to get your attention. He's saying, wake up. So let's see. If we just take a look at it. Of course, this is a declaration of God's pursuit. For thus saith the Lord God, behold, I, even I, will both search my sheep and seek them out. God's relentless pursuit. This other passage, we all know it. I don't even have to show the text. Can we recite it? For God so loved the world that he, he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Let's, so let's look at God's pursuit. Let's look at the several ways that God pursued the children of Israel as he went through that probationary period. Number one, we want to look at God's providence. And how do we see God's providence in the whole interaction, in the whole um, transaction? We see God allowing the Persians to take over. They, they defeated the ba Babylonians even without having to bridge the gate because the gate was left what? Open. 
And because the Persians came in, brothers and sisters, for, 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 for the first time, the children of Israel were able to experience religious liberty. For the first time, they were not treated as slaves or strangers, but they were allowed to freely practice their religion. We call that providence. Let, let's look at another way God would have intervened or, or pursued his children. His provision, and I'm going to give you a passage of scripture just now to support all those things. As they were about to rebuild the city and the walls of Jerusalem, Nehemiah spoke to the king, and the king, brothers and sisters, gave him leave and permitted him to go to the forest and to retrieve lumber from there so that they could have materials to build the city. God provided. Again, we see in God's pursuit protection because the king gave Nehemiah uh, his seal. So as he went through the different trans-Euphrates areas, he was permitted to pass through. It's like you coming through. When I, when I, when I came to England um, later, earlier this week, I was really nervous because I thought they would send me back home, right? <laughs> I'm about approaching the officer. He's swiping my um, passport, and the machine is not working. And he said, mate, my, my machine doesn't like your passport. I, I panicked. <laughs> but, but as they went through the different re regions on their way to Jerusalem, they were permitted to pass through because guess what? The king had ordered it. They had the king still. And let's, let's go again. Of course, they got their own place, yeah? God allowed them to restore and rebuild. And finally, I would say one of the most important aspects of God's pursuit, prophetic intervention. Haggai, Zechariah, Malachi, the list continues. Let me just show you some passages of scripture just to prove all those things. So look at God's providence. You must know this prophecy. Thus saith the Lord to his anointed to whom? To Cyrus. And this prophecy was written how long before, the, before it happened? About 300 years, right? To Cyrus is anointed whose right hand I have holden to subdue nations before him. I will do what? Loose the loins of kings to open before him the two left gates and the gate shall not be Shut. God's providence, they literally marched through the ri riverbed and Babylon fell that very night. We call that providence. Again, we look at God's provision. The Bible says to us here, the king asked me, what is your request? The king is speaking to Nehemiah. Then I prayed to the God of heaven and I answered the king and it seemed good to the king that if your servant has found favor in your sight, send me to the city of Judah where my ancestors are buried, that I may rebuild it. Then the king with the queen sitting beside me asked me, how long will your journey take? And when, you when will you return? Since it pleased the king to send me, I set a time for him, and I said to the king, if it pleases, let him give me letters for the governors of the trans-Euphrates that will enable me to pass through until I arrive in Judah as well as a letter to Asaph, the keeper of the king's forest, so he will give me lumber to make beams for the gates of the fortress adjacent to the temple, for the wall of the city, and for the residence which I will occupy. The king granted me the request because the good hand of my God was on him. So you see what's happening there, brothers and sisters. God is providing. But don't think that God is just providing to enlarge our territories. There's a purpose in all this provision because remember, God is what? He's pursuing us. And there's a reason for his pursuit. He wants to save you. Prophetic intervention, which was the last point in terms of the ways that God pursued them. I have what? Continue to send you all my servants and prophets. I'm going to read the last line. But you would not listen to me or pay any attention. It's like the preacher standing here every Sabbath and God is speaking to you. And God is saying, I'm trying to get your attention. But God doesn't stop there. After all the prophets have been killed and rejected, 
God gets desperate because the time is about to be fulfilled. We are now beyond, the, the New Testament era has begun. They only have about seven more years left. And they have not met the terms of their probation. But God, in his mercy, brothers and sisters, he intensifies his efforts. And so God says, God's acting out of, uh, desperately out of love, begins to pursue with greater degree his children. So what does he do? He sends his best man. John the Baptist, the Bible describes him as a friend of the bridegroom. The Bible also describes him as the greatest prophet who ever lived. What happened to John the Baptist, guys? Yep, he wasn't embraced. So God says, you know what? Wow, they don't they get it. Time is running out. Out of desperation, God says, if man can do it, I must come do it myself. So God sends Jesus Christ, reveals him as the Messiah. What did we do? Then with Jesus, who is called Messiah, Pilate asked them, what can we do? The response of the crowd whom he came to save, crucify him. But guess what? God says, you remember Messiah is cut off in the midst of the week. If you understand the prophecy, there are still three and a half years left. God says, I'm not going to short change them. So guess what he does? God says, perhaps my son, he couldn't be everywhere at the same time. If he's in Galilee, that he's limited to Galilee. If he's in Capernaum, he's limited there. Let me give them my Holy Spirit. So, yeah, Pentecost, Holy Spirit came down, fell on God's people. What did they do to the disciples, guys? Every last one of them, save John, was murdered. I'm showing you God's pursuit and all what he has done and all what he's doing for you and I. Wow. Now when we think of the love of God, there's nothing we can say to really describe it. Sometimes I feel like God is treating us unfairly and take me in context there. He's treating us unfairly because he's given us grace that we don't deserve. The wages of sin is death, the Bible says. But instead of death, he gives us life. That's, that's fact is some of us will be lost. But not for the lack of effort on God's part. It's because we have misappropriated his acts of kindness as tokens of our own self-righteousness. And because we have outrightly rejected his grace in our lives. By the way, on a side note, this is not in the sermon, it came to my head. The very definition for ingratitude is to reject the grace of God. That's what the Greek word means. Akaristos, to reject God's grace. Let's look at point number two. How do I apply this prophecy to myself? It's impossible, guys, to know so much and to still miss the point. I'm almost certain I could stand here and do Bible boxing with the entire church. I might not win, but I'll last some time. Because in my mind, I have a, a couple of scriptures in there. But that does me no good if I've missed the essence of Christianity. Let's look at it, guys. So through the prophecy... They could have traced the time of Jesus' birth, his baptism, his death. They could have all, they also knew, by the way, 
the exact time that their probation, according to the prophecy, would have ended. Remember, they had a timeline. Every Jewish child has been drilled in that department. They knew everything. Now, let me give you an example. Remember when um, the wise men came, uh, the birth of Christ, and, and they went to Herod, and they were seeking for the king that was born. Herod is a bit confused, knows of no other king but himself. So he calls in all the um, religious teachers and instructors, and he says to them, tell me. So let me read it for you. The reference is right there. When the king Herod heard this, he was disturbed, and all Jerusalem with him. And when he had called together all the people's chiefs, uh, priests, sorry, and teachers and of the law, he asked them where the Messiah was to be born. In Bethlehem, Judah, they replied, for this is what the prophet had written, and they quoted the scripture. Now notice, brothers and quickly, brothers and sisters, how quickly they responded to the king's question. Where is he going to be born? Tell me now. In Bethlehem, they quoted the text. They knew it from memory. I want you to juxtapose this with the experience that the wise men had with Nebuchadnezzar. When Nebuchadnezzar made the request to reveal my dream, what did they say? We need time. We don't know. But those guys are well informed. Those guys were immediately, brothers and sisters, able to quote from the Bible and say to Herod, this is where he will be born. They knew the Bible. But did Jesus come? Did they accept him? No, they didn't. So this is where we apply to ourselves as a church. We know so much, yet we do so little. By the way, Pastor, we had no conversation about what message I should preach. So I'm not throwing stones at you on his behalf. Like I said, this is me studying the Bible and sharing it with you. As a church, guys, we, we know so much, yet we have missed the essence of Christianity. We know so much, yet we misrepresent God. Unfortunately, the Bible says even the Gentiles blaspheme the name of God as they see us. As a church, we know the Ten Commandments from memory. If I ask you what's the Fifth Commandment, what's the Fourth Commandment, you could tell me exactly what it is. But the truth is, we don't really know it from the heart. We know the Ten Commandments from memory, yet we dislike each other. The word on the screen is too strong. We know the Ten Commandments from memory, yet God receives last place in our lives. And there's this new form of idolatry that is developing where God is placed in the back pocket. And we treat him, treat him like a vending machine. So the only time we need God is when things are rough and you, 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 went, you run, you pop in a prayer and expect a blessing to come out. As a church, guys, we know all the prophecies, yet we have no sense of urgency. Do you understand, brothers and sisters, that Jesus is really coming soon? And that all we have read about, all those, I mean, I remember when I just came into this church, a lot of the things that I'm experiencing now, I never thought I would experience them. I thought they were in a distant future. It's crazy. Our world, things are happening in a, in a, in a quick succession. Sense of urgency. I feel no burden, yeah? Let me share a story with you. When I came into the church, I was never a public speaker, by the way. I was uh, like stage fright. And I used to go to work every morning, and I would see this girl on the side of the street, getting ready to go to school, waiting for the school bus. And every time I saw her, like, I really want to just talk to her and tell her something about Jesus. I'm not thinking about girls in terms of, I want you to be my girlfriend. No, I just want to share with her what I know. But I'm shy, man. 
I'm afraid. I, I, I want to. But every time I try to, it's like this fear takes over. So I kind of recuse myself and try to. And, and one day it got so intense. I just couldn't take it. I had to say something. Didn't know what to say. So I just mustered up some courage. And I went by the girl. And I said, girl. And I shouted, by the way. They know how to act. Girl, who's your mother? That's the only thing that could have come to my mind. And she told me. And then somehow the Lord just put in my mind. Ask her for a Bible study. And I said, can, can, come, can I come to your house with my, with my elder and we do a Bible study with you and your family? And she said, yes. Took her address. Told my elder that next week we were there. And I think a month later, about seven people, she included all her family members who were baptized. Yeah. Sense of urgency. You know what this tells me all the time? In Trinidad, we have a lot of them. We're um, street dwellers. And we, sometimes we pass them like street all the time. And a thought came to my mind the other day. Could you imagine what Adam would have, like his reaction, if God were to permit him to see what's happening on earth right now? You remember what Sister White says about Adam's reaction to the first leaf that was dried there, yeah? or that turned brown? It brought him tears and pain. Could you imagine when Adam sees the depravity of humanity? How he would react. And I'm like, Lord, please don't let it be normal. I don't want it to be normal that I just pass street dwellers on the street, man. These are human beings. And I know it's so easy to walk past. But I think as a church, we, we need to start thinking of solutions. How can we take care of them? How can we feed them? And the truth is, they are not all drug addicts. Some of them have had real life experiences. Remember this very street dweller, we, uh, uh, the, the school, I, I also, um, I'm connected to one of the schools, Adventist University in Trinidad, and we had an activity for young people where we went in the streets, and we just were engaging the street dwellers, feeding them and that kind of stuff, and I met this guy, and while talking to him, I just found out that this guy was a lawyer. He was really doing good, was successful. But one day he went home. Unfortunately, he went home too early. Met his wife with another guy on the bed, and it just tripped him. It threw him off. Never recovered from that. So what I'm saying to you, people go through things. And sometimes they are forced into situations. Unfortunately, they don't have the knowledge of Scripture that you have. But they need our help. They need our help, brothers and sisters. So we need to feel that burden when we see people on the streets, wherever they may be, try to help them. And of course, comfortable there. Yeah? You see that guy in the reclining chair there? This can't be our condition. We can't be so comfortable. Let's go. This is the last point, by the way. And you should know Caribbean preachers are long-winded. I apologize. Probation is too short to allow it to be characterized by form and pretense. If you know the prophecy, it begins in 457 BC. And 490 years culminates in AD 34. It almost perfectly aligns itself with what we call the 400 years of silence that, that exists between the books of Malachi and Matthew. You know what happened during that period? The church went berserk, the children of Israel, all, all the different factions that we know or we read of in the Bible. The Pharisees are formed, Sadducees are formed. They begin to believe a whole lot of different crazy things and assimilated it into the religion that they had. The thing that they received from Moses is the law. They built around it. So um, 10 commandments become 613 different laws. Form, pretense, ceremony, a whole lot of it. Well, let's look at it. In the context of the prophecy, Israel's probation was short. Follow me now. The prophecy is 2,300 years. 
Israel's probation is only 490 years. Let me give you a visual. This is how short it is. So the blue part represents the 23, the 18, 10 years here. When you, did, when you deduct the 490. The little red part, that's what their probation looked like. When we speak of it, it seems like a long time. But in context of the prophecy, it's not, it's not all that great. By the way, that blue part of the chart you see there represents the growth and development of Israel's successor. Who is Israel's successor, guys? Let me ask that question again. Who is Israel's successor? The churches. So now, I reverse it a bit. 1810, from eight, that is from 1834 to 1844. Growth and development of the, the, the Christian church. And then from 1844 to now, I have 2023 because the date is October for an entire year to be complete, so I had to leave it there. But this year would be 170 what? So, something, yeah? Since our probation began. We don't have much time, guys. You're saying it right? We don't have much time. So what's happening to us? The devil has figured that we don't have much time, so he's gotten us a bit distracted. We are not bad people, but we are a distracted bunch of people. We've forgotten our purpose, why God called us. And so we are busy pursuing mammon. God would have assessed the church of Laodicea. And one of the things that Laodicea struggles with is materialism. And, and there's a message in the Bible, by the way. Read the writings of Paul. There's a call to simplicity, especially in the last days. So you don't have to get a Mercedes Benz. All you need is a car. You follow me? Simplicity. You don't have to get a mansion. You just need a house. Somewhere you can be comfortable. Some of us get tied up because we want to be like everybody else. And we get caught in the web of materialism. You just need clothes on your back, man. You don't need that expensive brand. Call to simplicity. Our time is precious. We have but few, very, very few days of probation in which to make ready for the future immortal life. We have no time to do what? Spend in haphazard moments. We should fear to skim the surface of the word of God. Let me share. Like, we are to make the best of our present opportunities. There will be no other probation given to us in which to prepare for heaven. This is our only and last opportunity to form characters. Will there be another opportunity? The answer is no. It's only now. Probably share one more. By the way, you could get all those slides I'll share with you. Probably just give to pastor. All right. So let me go here. Just want to skip. This is the title of the sermon. This is where I want to end. So Luke 13, 6, and what, what do we do, guys, recognizing that we've, we've missed the mark as a church? Then he told this parable. A man had a fig tree growing in his vineyard, and he went to look for the fruit on it, but did not find any. So he said to the man who took care of the vineyard for three years, by the way, three years, three and a half years of Jesus' ministry, he had been pursuing the children of Israel, had been coming to look for fruit on this fig tree, and haven't found any. Cut it down. Why should it use up soil? Sir, the man replied, leave it one more year. And I'll dig around it and fertilize it. If it bears fruit next year, fine. If not, then I'll cut it down. God is saying to us today, just one more year. Don't know how it will translate. But God is saying, one more year. 
In other words, I'm giving you time. I want you to understand that. I want to save you. Just one more year to get it done. Oh, I pray by God's grace today. That we all here would determine our hearts to just take advantage of that one more year that is given to us. So we're gonna I'm gonna ask you. God just wants you to be real and genuine, sincere. He wants you to recognize that the things of eternity are far more, far more weightier than the things of this life. So he's appealing to you today. Please. What's the name of this church? Abaddon? Abaddon is here, church members, please. I love you enough. I want to save you. I need you to work with me. Is there anybody here this morning who is hearing the word of God and you are determined in your heart? You are saying today, Lord, I've heard your message. I want you to work with me. That's your heart's desire. Then just raise your hand with me. God bless you. ask you to pray with me. Father, we ever so often are confronted with a word from you. Today you've said to us we need to make some changes. Time is running out. I think the encouraging thing about this entire message is the fact that you love us so much. Yes, it brings before us the reality of our failure sometimes as Christians. But it also brings to us that awesome privilege of knowing that there is a God who is loving and kind and merciful enough to work with us and to bring us to that place of salvation. I want to pray for our brethren here today. This message is not one to condemn anyone is to bring before eyes current condition and just to allow you to enter into our hearts. We're not perfect, man. We've made mistakes. Sometimes we come to you and we pray the same prayer for the same old sin over and over. We recognize, Lord, our humanity. But we also recognize that you are God and that you are willing to save us. So be with your children today. And use us, we pray, by God's grace. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And God's people say, Amen.